in honor of the reading of God's Word, those that are able, Luke 16, 13 through 15. There it is on the screen in front of you. And the King James text today reads, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Wow, boy, that sounds like it's going to be quite a message, doesn't it? Holy, holy, holy. If you'll bow your heads with me a moment. Once again, Father, we thank you, God, for this day, this hour. We thank you, Lord, for the word of God. We thank you, God that you have provided us in writing a printed promise, a copy of the contract, a copy of that wonderful document, Lord, which you have breathed upon men's spirits, which you have encouraged men to write so that we might better understand you and know you and come into relationship with you. Truly this afternoon, the word of the Lord is, in fact, and indeed, a love letter from heaven. And help us, God, to understand that as we read it. And help us to read it, God, within that framework. Lord, the word of God must go forth. My body is tired. My mind is worn. I ask, God, that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest upon me, that I might capably... Deliver unto the people of God the word of the Lord that you've laid upon my heart. Bring restoration and healing to those today who need it. Heal bodies, Lord, by sending forth your word to heal. Heal minds, deliver God from bondages, save the lost, reclaim the backslider. Master, in the name of Jesus, use us and use us powerfully. For, Lord, your word, if handled correctly, is able to perform life-saving surgery. We ask God today that every ear would be open to hear and every heart would be equally open to hear and receive that which the Spirit would speak unto the church. For we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. God bless you this afternoon. You may be seated. And amen. Holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. Holy, holy, holy. In the book of Isaiah, the third chapter, we read of a vision that Isaiah is given of the Lord in his throne room in heaven. And Isaiah states, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon his throne, and he was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And he then goes on in verse number 3 to explain that these strange and unusual angelic beings, three of them that flew about the throne, would cry one unto the other. They literally were screaming, Martin, from one to the other in chain. Holy! And then the second would cry out, Holy! And the third would cry out, Holy! Hallelujah! Holy, holy, holy. Isaiah 6 and 3. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
Now the holy, the word holy that they are using in Isaiah 6 and 3 is H-O-L-Y. They are declaring the holiness of God. Now Lisa, growing up as I did in a good old Trinitarian Pentecostal church, it was always explained to me that the reason that the cherubims cried out, you know, holy, holy, holy in three, was that this is in deference to the Trinity. Well, folks, let me ask you a question. Where do you get that notion from? Is there anywhere stated in here that they're saying holy, holy, holy has to do with any, it has anything in the universe to do with the Trinity? No. That is a man made logic, that is man made reasoning. I'll never forget a scene in a movie, an old movie made back in, I believe, in the 40s or 50s, that tells the story of Martin Luther. And I love it. It's an old black and white film. It's a little melodramatic, you know, but it's a wonderful film. And I, I love this old film, and I've got it, and I, we've actually shown it at the church at times. But it really cracks me up because at one point, there is a man who goes to the Pope, as was common in those days, and he wanted to buy a position within the church. So he offered a certain amount of money. And the Pope says, well, you know, why don't we boost that up to, say, 12 pounds of gold or whatever it was? You know, one pound for each of the apostles. And the man says, well, why don't I make it three pounds, one for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Ghost? And the Pope concedes and says, well, let's just make it so many. And he, he applies, I forget what the reasoning was, you know. But in other words, you can go to Scripture and you can justify any number you want to justify with some kind of logic and some kind of reasoning, okay? So to say that they're saying holy, holy, holy is in deference to the Trinity is idiotic because you can apply all kinds of reasoning to their using the word holy three times. Do you follow what I'm saying? But when you understand as well that there are three creatures and the Bible tells us they're crying one unto another, well, how, what number are you going to come up with if they're doing that? How, how, what number are you going to come up with? If there's three creatures and each one is crying to the other, then you're going to get three cries. You're going to get holy, 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 right? If you look at biblical numerology, numerology is taking numbers and applying certain meaning to various numbers based on... Uh, the interpretation and understanding of things. And in a, when it comes to biblical numerology, the number three indicates perfection. It indicates completion. Okay, that's what the number three indicates. The Word of God tells us that God has called His people to be holy. The Word of God declares in, uh, let me see here, I know I have it. <laughs> First Peter 1.16, pardon, I told you all I'm pooped today, so pray for me. First Peter 1.16, Peter writes, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, there are all kinds of people in the church world who will try to tell you what the term holy means. And those of us that come from the Holiness Pentecostal Church, boy, we've got that has to do with all kinds of rules and regulations and standards, as they're called. But God said, be ye holy, for I am holy. Why would God tell us to do something that it, unless it was possible, unless it was something within our grasp. Well, because the word holy literally in the Greek translates 
to be perfect, to be complete, listen, or to be mature. Now, if you're seven and you act like a seven-year-old, you're mature. If you're 30 and you act like a seven-year-old, you are immature. You are not living up to your potential. So what God is saying is, Martin, live up to your potential. Live up to that level of maturity that you ought to be walking in at the time and at the place that you stand right now. God doesn't expect you to be something you're going to be after the rapture. Hello now. He doesn't expect you to be as perfect. He doesn't expect you to be as complete. He doesn't expect you to be as mature as you're going to be after the Lord has returned from the church. But He expects you to be mature. He expects you, in other words, He expects you to walk in the knowledge that you have at the time. That's why the Word of God tells us, To him that knoweth to do good and does it not, to him, it is sin. If you know the right thing to do, God expects you to do it. If you know the right thing to do, he expects you to do it. If you don't do what you know you ought to be doing, it is sin. So it's simple. All God is saying is live up to your knowledge. Live up to your level of uh, maturity as you exist and as you walk in it now in the here and now. There are a lot of Christians who have been in the church for 40 years and they still act like spiritual babies. They still have no greater understanding of God. They still have no greater understanding of the things of God. They still have no greater understanding of the Word of God than they did when they first came into the church. I had a lady in one of the groups that I created online. I created a group, True Christians against Trump's evil agenda. Yeah, you heard me say it. And this woman wanted to write the other day, and she, she posted this ridiculous diatribe about how Trump was the Antichrist. And she gave all this reasoning and all this foolishness, right? And I have to approve all posts. So no post gets posted unless I approve it. Well, I hate to not approve posts because then people accuse you, you know, of censoring and, you know, well, you're not allowing me to speak my mind. So I said, you know what, I'm going to approve this and then I'm going to respond to her and I'm going to explain some things to her. So I did. I posted and then I responded and I explained some things to her. I said, honey, you could not be any more wrong than you are right now. The Antichrist is described as being one who is so smooth and so slick and so deceptive that he will be able to deceive the nations. He will be able to convince even the Jewish people that he is the Messiah. That is how slick he's going to be. And according to the word of God, it will not be until the second half of the tribulation that his mask will be taken off and he will be revealed for the really evil creature that he truly is. Well, she proceeded to write me back and let me know, I'm wrong. You're wrong. I'm right. Literally, this is what, I'm right. You're wrong. You need to read what I wrote again. You'll see that I'm right. <sighs> Folks, you know, I do not have time to live on the internet. I do not have time to sit there and argue with people and debate with people, especially people when they're out, up their rocker. Okay? I went to this woman's profile. See, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm not stupid. I, I, the way I do things is different than the way a lot of people do things. If you're writing all kind of crazy, you know, gibberish, I 
I'm going to go to your profile. I want to see what you're made out of. I want to see just how holy and how righteous and how godly you are. I want to see how much you know. And there she got all kind of pictures of her with blue hair and pink hair and purple hair and yellow hair. And she got all these stupid things. And I said, yep, just what I thought. She's off her rocker. You know, th this, is, this is stupid. This is crazy. So I tried to respond to her a couple extra times. I tried to reason with her, Martin, you know. Oh, you're right all this stuff. The Bible don't say nothing about what you're saying. I'm thinking, lady, the Bible don't say nothing. What I'm saying, this foolishness you've come out with is so great. Now, there was another man who was interjecting as well, and he appreciated what I was responding with and what have you. Well, anyway, finally, I had to delete her from the group and block her from the group because... I don't have time for people who are going to be argumentative and, you know, I just don't have time for it, okay? I manage quite a few groups that I've created over the years. I don't have time for it. So, Lisa, I tend to act very decisively, you know, and just, it's like, okay, I've gotten to the point where this, as far as I'm going to go with this mess, and if you ain't going to leave it alone, then boom, we're done, okay? So I, I cut her off. <sighs> She's trying to explain to me as part of her argument how that the church is supposed to bring righteousness to the world and we're supposed to affect the world and we're supposed to try to make people in the world act more godly and more righteous. And again, I wrote her back and I said, um, Sister, you could not be more wrong. You could not be more wrong. The job of the church, Martin, is not to keep the Titanic afloat. The Titanic being the world. The world is headed on a path of destruction. The Bible said, except the days were shortened, there should no flesh be saved. In other words, if God did not shorten the days, if he didn't speed up his plan, in order to bring the rapture about and bring the end of the world about, he said humanity would destroy all flesh, all flesh, not humanity, all flesh. In other words, probably there'd be nuclear annihilation and every single living animal and beast and human on this planet would be destroyed. So God said, except the days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? So I'm trying to explain to her. I said, honey, we're not called to grab a bucket and try to keep the world afloat. We're not called to keep this sinking ship afloat. We are called to operate a life raft and to go out in the icy waters and throw the lifeline, which is Jesus, to as many as will grab hold of it. And the life raft is the church. Hallelujah. And our job is to save those who are lost and dying and pull them from the icy waters and pull them onto the life raft, which is the church. But the boat's going to sink. You're not going to save the boat. But the people in the church are called to live righteously. The people in the church are called to live godly. The people in the church are called to be a light in a lost and dying world. But we are not called to keep that ship afloat. We are not called to try to make everybody on that ship act like we do on the boat. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Our mission is spiritual. It is not carnal. The Lord Jesus Christ said in the judgment hall, My kingdom is not of this world. He said, if it were of this world, then would my subjects fight. Then would my servants rise up and fight. If my kingdom were of this world, and you were trying to do to me what you're trying to do to me, then my subjects would all rise up and protest, and they would fight. He said, but my kingdom is not of this world. We approach things differently. Because we have a different mind and we have a different objective. And what we've been called to do is a spiritual mission, not a carnal mission. So I wrote this lady back and I explained to her. I said, sister, let me tell you a little secret. You've got the same exact mindset 
as Trump worshipers. The only difference is you don't support Trump. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I don't. Oh, yes, you do. Because the Trump people are claiming that he is going to restore righteousness to America. And he and God is using him to bring righteousness and to do all this. I said, you have the same identical mindset they do. You are focused on the wrong mission just like they are. And she could not see that for the trees. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. There are a lot of Christians. Look at the evangelical community. Look at the fundamentalist community. How immature, how ignorant, how carnal are they in their spirituality that they do not understand that God has not called us to have political power. God has not called us to have social influence. God has not called us to change the behavior of those about us. As a matter of fact, my Bible said, where sin doth abound, grace doth even more abound. You want revival in the church? Then let sin run rampant in the world. Hallelujah. Because the worse it gets out there, the better it gets in here if we're doing our job right. My Lord, is that all right? <laughs> Hallelujah. The Lord said you cannot have two relationships at the same time. Because if you try to have two relationships at the same time, you will not be able to give either of those relationships your all. You will not be able to devote yourself Holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. You wonder why I'm using the visual aid. You wonder why I'm using this panel today. A young man sitting with a young lady has got his arm around her. And yet behind her back, he's clasping hands with a young fellow sitting on the other side of her. Obviously... This is someone, listen to me now, so you understand what I'm saying, who's trying to serve both God and mammon. This is somebody who's trying to have a relationship with more than one person at one time. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I've tried to explain to people, I've had more people get mad at me over the years in the LGBT community because they came to me and they said, uh, I'm married to a member of the opposite gender, but I have discovered that I am LGBT, and what do I do? I, I'm having an affair with a woman, or I'm having an affair with a man. And I write them back, and I say, I'm sorry, that is adultery. If you want to be honest, if you want to live honestly, then give your wife, your husband, their freedom. And then move on with your life. It is not fair to that person for you to be living a double existence. It is not fair to them. You're not able to give them everything they deserve in a spouse. And guess what, honey? You are not able to give your same-sex partner the same attention and the same devotion and the same energy that you could give them if you were not married to that person. Am I telling the truth? So you see, you can't serve both God and man. You can't have two relationships at one time when each relationship requires of you all of you. When each relationship requires that you give yourself wholly and completely to the other partner. And this is why Jesus said you cannot serve both God and mammon. Mammon, you want to chase money your whole life? Ask anybody. My father was one who worshipped money. My father was one who was always trying to impress the neighbors. Trying to impress his co-workers. He used to love to brag. If you've ever known people, it's kind of funny, but it's sad who love to brag about how much money they spent on stuff. 
if you came to our house to visit, my father would literally give you a tour through the house and tell you how much he paid for everything. Yes, this is, oh, Charlie, that's a beautiful living room set. Yeah, you know, I get $2,500 for that. And we're talking about back in the late 70s, early 80s, when $2,500 was a lot of money. My father back in the late 80s literally paid, listen to me, I'm not kidding, $6,000 for a stereo. Guess how many watts it was? At the time, it was mind-blowing. 200 watts. Ooh! I'm telling you, nobody in the universe owned a stereo that had 200 watts. My father literally would turn that stereo up in our living room, and it would almost knock the windows out of the house. Of course, it's summer, so they have the windows up, you know. And he would just love that the neighbors up on the hill could hear his garbage playing because he wanted everybody to know he had this $6,000. And oh, I mean to tell you, some of y'all might be saying, how in the world do you pay $6,000 for a stereo? It had a, it had a, uh, a record player, right? You put the record on like this. Now, it wasn't flat like this. You put the record on, then it had an arm that's locked over, you know, and then the record would start playing. So the record was rotating like this rather than like that. You follow what I'm saying? It was horizontal, uh, vertical, I mean, instead of horizontal. He had a dual tape deck, one of them, the reel-to-reel. -reel. That's what they used to call it. It had a reel-to-reel. -reel. Who in the world listens to reel-to-reel -reel anything? This, this stereo system, I'll never forget as long as I live, it was made by Mitsubishi. And my father used to love to brag to everybody in the world, I've got a Mitsubishi with four speakers. Each speaker stood about four feet high, literally. I'm not kidding. And he had them around the living room, you know. And he would brag. Well, my father worked in a factory. My father was not, you know, president of a bank. He wasn't some big executive. He worked in a factory. How do you figure my father had money to buy all this stuff? He worked constantly. My father was constantly working. He was, everybody that knew him referred to him as a workaholic, you know. He'd spend 16 hours a day at the factory. He'd come home, watch TV a little bit, go to sleep, go back and work. Another 16 hours at the factory. Not because he wanted to feed his family. Not because he wanted to be a proud daddy and care for his kids. And no, that wasn't what motivated him. He wanted all these toys he could brag about. And if you're going to live for money, listen to me now. You're going to find yourself consumed. Because money and wealth and prosperity require that you give yourself Holy to its cause. You follow what I'm telling you now? It'll, it'll gobble up all your time. You'll lose marriages. You'll lose relationships with your kids. Am I telling the truth today? You will lose everything in your life that has to do with other human beings as you pursue money. I know too many people, Lisa, who lose their marriages because they're chasing the almighty buck. You cannot serve both God and mammon. God, the Lord was simply saying, you cannot have two relationships and have either one of those two relationships get the full attention that they deserve. That's what the Lord was saying. It's really quite simple. When the angels cried out one to another, Holy, holy, holy! The truth of the matter is, in that threefold cry, they were acknowledging God's perfection. You remember what I said about numerology? Three is emblematic of perfection. It means maturity. It means completion. They were declaring God is perfect. 
He is not merely holy. He is holy times three. Hallelujah. And anything times three equals that thing in perfection. Hallelujah. So if you know anything about uh, algebra, then you know. So look at it like this. Anything times three equals the answer to that equation times whatever it is you're applying it to. So you might say God is not holy. He's triple holy. Well, by being triple holy, he is perfect in holiness. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? That is what the angels were declaring. But instead of standing there saying, God is perfect in holiness. <laughs> they cried one unto another, holy. And then the other one said, oh, that ain't holy enough. Holy. And the other one said, oh, no, no, that ain't perfect enough. Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Hallelujah. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? My God. Holy. We are called today to be holy. Well, I've got news for you today. Holy. H-O-L-Y. Translates quite simply to holy. W H O L L Y. Living the Christian life on Sunday only to go out Monday through Saturday and do as you please is not at all holy living. Holiness is about giving the Lord all, it's about giving God everything. We don't give him Sunday, Martin, and then take Monday through Saturday and do with it as we please. Hallelujah. Every day that I wake up, every day that I function in this life, I function with the desire to please God and to be a witness to a lost world. Do you follow what I'm saying? I don't just live that on Sunday. I'm going to tell you something. There are certain people in certain communities that just love to do that. Oh, they'll go to church, man, and I mean, they'll dance it up, and they'll put on a good show on Sunday, and they no sooner get out the door of the church, oh, and they're doing all kinds of stuff they know they ought not to be doing. I've got news for you. There is no holiness in that. There is no holiness in that because you are not holy giving yourself unto God. W-H-O-L-L-Y. You are giving God a portion of yourself. You're giving God a portion of your time. You're giving God a portion of your effort. But he has not called us to partiality. He has called us to holiness. W-H-O-L-I-N-E-S-S. -S. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? And holiness, W-H-O-L-I-N-E-S-S, -S, translates to holiness. H-O-L-I-N-E-S-S. -S. Holiness, holiness is about complete devotion. It is about complete and total surrender. It is about following the Lord wholly and entirely. Who wants to be in a relationship today where your partner only seeks to please you one day a week? Raise your hand if that's the kind of marriage you want to be in. Raise your hand if that's the kind of guy you want to date or the kind of gal you want to date. Yeah, I want somebody who one day a week is going to decide that they're going to do everything in their power there one day to make me happy. And then all six of the other days they could care less. They're going to do as they please. Now, I like to show on television. I'm going to get some of these apostolic high hairs mad at me. So be it. I mentioned television. That's the biggest sin in the world. There's a program that is called Mike and Molly. It's funny. But there are a lot of things said on the show, honestly, that I could live without. That, that it's, it tends to be vulgar at times. I hate vulgarity. I don't see the need for it. I'm anything in the world but approved. But I'm a Christian. And Martin, my ears are not garbage cans. And I don't want to hear a bunch of garbage. I don't like to hear a bunch of vulgarity. I don't like to hear a bunch of cussing. I don't hear like to hear a bunch of sexual innuendo and all that. 
But they have a character on this show that annoys the fire out of me. I'm going to make some enemies. Oh, preacher, you're being judgmental. They've got old grandma, Carl's grandma. You know Carl. That's Mike's co-worker, the cop, and his black co-worker, you know. Carl lives with his grandma. Well, grandma has a habit of making statements that annoy me to no end because they represent Christianity at its worst. One day, old grandma comes down the stairs and Mike says, well, hello there, Nana. How are you today? She said, I'm right with my God and tight with my bookie. Oh, that's funny, ain't it? Ha, 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 ha. They were talking, and he asked her, uh, she asked him something about drinking. I don't remember what it was. And then she said, well, if you don't drink on Saturday, you have nothing to talk with Jesus about on Sunday. This is emblemic of a very loose, non-committal relationship with the Lord. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? When I hear statements like this, it just curdles my blood. It just makes me so aggravated because I'm telling you folks, I know too many people in our community today who that is their Christian experience. That is what they give God. They give God seconds. They give God Sunday and Monday through Saturday. They're out there playing every devil they can play. Hello now. They're doing everything. Their testimony goes out the window the minute they leave the church house. That is not what we have been called to. We have been called to holiness. We have been called to resemble the Savior. We have been called to uh, emulate the Master. We have been called to reflect the light of the sun, S-O-N, even as the moon reflects the light of the sun and creates a light in the darkest of night skies. If there's anything that amazes me, Tommy and I were talking the other day, and we were looking at a beautiful moon, you know, and it was just shining. And I said, isn't it amazing that that body can be out there in space and at nighttime it literally provides a nightlight for the whole planet at least one half of the time. And it's just reflecting the light of the sun. The moon has no light of its own. It does not produce any light of its own. But because, Martin, of the material that it's made out of, it reflects the light of the sun as if it were its own light. We have been called to be a light in this world. You have nothing of your own that is able to project light, but you are able to reflect the light of Him. Hallelujah. You are able to reflect the light of the Lord Jesus Christ so that people in the dark world can see where they're going and they can find their way. Hello now. We are called to holiness. Holiness requires that we give ourselves holy Holy, holy to God. Holy, perfectly holy, completely holy, maturely holy. What is in our life today that prevents us from being willing to give the Lord our all? Pursuit of money, wealth, status. Some people are so wanting to be Celebrities, that they will do anything to pursue celebrity, pride, reputation, comforts. What is it in your life today that prevents you from being willing to give the Lord your all? Listen to me now. 1 John 5, 1 through 8, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. But he that believeth, excuse me, I'm sorry, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God.
this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Now listen to this. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word. They do not use the term the Son. The writer, John, uses the term the Word, not Son. He said there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. How are you perfect? How are you complete? When you are three, it's easy. Those three are one. Do you follow what I'm telling you? They are perfect. They are complete. They are incomplete. There is no completion unless you have all three ingredients. Now listen to what the writer continues to write. He said, uh, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. So once again, you have that concept of three being complete. You have that concept of three being perfect. You follow? See, when it talks about water and blood, let me explain that to you a little bit real quick. Water speaks to the maternal. Blood speaks to the paternal. Where do you get your blood type from? Your daddy. Where do you get your start from? Mama. Where does your life begin? In the water. Mm -hmm. Hello now. Yep. You're in mama's womb and you're in a sack of water, basically, is what it amounts to. So what he's saying is that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, did not come by mother only, but he came by mother and father. The only difference is, he says, who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus Christ is who? The Son of who? God. So we say, yes, we believe he was physically born. We believe he was physically born of a mother. But we believe his paternal parent, his uh, father, was God. So the blood that flowed through his veins had its origins from God. God had to create the blood that filled Jesus' veins. Did you hear me now? Did you hear what I said? God had to prepare the blood. That's why we used to sing the old song, His blood was precious blood. It wasn't just, pre it wasn't just the blood of another spotless lamb. His blood was precious blood, for it bore the sins of man. His blood had healed my body, and it set my spirit free. I'm so glad his precious blood still flows from Calvary. Hallelujah. His blood, Martin, was divine blood. His blood had its origins in heaven. God had to prepare that cocktail specifically, uniquely for the man, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Oh, my goodness, have mercy. Now listen. In Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Hmm. Heart, soul, mind. Holy. Heart, soul, mind. Complete. Are you following me? One, two, three. What does three mean in biblical numerology? Complete. He said, Thou shalt, he didn't say you love the Lord with all your heart. He didn't say you love the Lord with all your mind. He didn't say you love the Lord with all your spirit. He said, no. He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with, what's that, what's that word? All thy soul and with all thy mind. Are you following me today? One, two, three. Complete. So Jesus is saying you need to love God 
completely. You don't love them with a little part of your heart and a little part of your soul and a little part of your mind and call it complete. No, to be complete, each element has to be all. Has to be all of your heart. Has to be all of your soul. It has to be all of your mind. In other words, you got to love the Lord wholly. W-H-O-L-L-Y. 1 Thessalonians 6.23. This will really bring it together for you. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. W-H-O-L-L-Y. That's Read it. That's what it says. And the very God of peace sanctify you. W-H-O-L-L-Y. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body. One, two, three. Not part of your spirit, not part of your soul, not part of your body. No, he said, and I pray to God that your whole spirit and soul and body. What does three mean? Complete. Perfect. Hello now. That your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, in Colossians 2, 8 through 15, Paul writes, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Yeah, that's what the evangelicals and that's what the fundamentalists are doing. Trying to tell you that we're supposed to change the world. We're supposed to make the world look more Christ-like. And we're supposed to bring righteousness to the world. No. That is philosophy and vain deceit. That is the tradition of men. That is the rudiments of the world that is not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness. Of the Godhead bodily. Term Godhead translates from the Greek literally. All that pertains to God. So Jesus Christ was perfect. Perfect in being God. Everything that pertained to God existed in him bodily. Everything that pertained to God existed in him bodily. Now listen. And ye are complete in him. <laughs> what does holy mean? Complete, perfect, mature. He said, ye are complete, you are holy, H-O-L-Y, in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What is the New Testament circumcision? You remember the Old Testament Jew? To be a Jew, you had to be a circumcised male, right? What is the New Testament circumcision? Well, number one, the New Testament circumcision is not reserved for male only. It's for both male and female. What is it? Read verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you, all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. You know the word ordinances. You're familiar with that. You know every town has ordinances. They have rules. They have regulations. He said blotting out every ordinance that was against us. Hallelujah. Which was contrary to us and took it out of the way. Nailing it to the cross. 
Oh, hallelujah. Every rule, every regulation, every law that got in my way and prevented me from getting to God, Jesus blotted it out. He took ink and poured it on the contract. He poured it on the books so you can't even see those rules anymore. They don't apply. He cleared the way. He made ready the way. Listen, finally today. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumph, triumphing over them in it. But I want to remind you of verse 10. And ye are complete in him. Our holiness does not come from our actions. Our holiness does not come from that which we do or that which we don't do or that which we wear or that which we don't wear. We are complete in him. Our holiness comes from being buried in baptism with him. That is the New Testament baptism. Uh, excuse me, the New Testament circumcision. Water baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are baptized, we are circumcised, as it were, into the New Testament church. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? And you start with a clean slate because it says he forgives all our sins and he blots out every ordinance that was against us and was contrary to us, meaning that stood in our way. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for that today? Amen. Glory to God. Almost done. Last passage of scripture. I haven't gone an hour. I've got about 10 minutes, but I'm, I'm going to try to cut it shorter than that. I know this service took forever to get going today on account of technical difficulties. Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Here's what the Apostle Paul wrote. Here's what a man who has revered the world over and has been revered for centuries, excuse me, millennium, by New Testament believers. Were it not for the work of this man, I dare say not a one of us would be in this church today. Not a one of us would be in the body of Christ today. This is what the Apostle Paul had to say. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. But I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. In Christ Jesus. My goodness, the Apostle Paul did not think himself perfect. How do you like them apples? The Apostle Paul was not holiness. He wasn't a holiness believer because he didn't think himself perfect. He didn't think because he followed all the rules and he did everything the way he was supposed to do it that he stood before God holy because perfect and holy, H O L Y, are synonymous. That's why the Lord said, be ye holy, for I am holy. And another place in Scripture, he said, be ye perfect, for I am perfect. He was not telling us to be two different things. He was saying the same thing. He was saying it two different ways. Perfect and holiness and holy are synonymous. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Paul said, not as though I'm already perfect, but I'm aiming toward that. That is why in Hebrews, the Word of God says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see God it doesn't tell us that you have to have holiness it tells us you need to be in pursuit of holiness oh hallelujah do you understand what I'm telling you today it tells you you need to be in pursuit of holiness makes me think of the old 
Oh, I, I tell you, these Pentecostal folks, they're going to turn me off. I, I can just hear computers shutting down all over the world right now. <laughs> Reminds me of the old Smokey and the Bandit movies. You remember Jackie Gleason? I'm in hot pursuit. <laughs> he was chasing the bandit. I'm in hot pursuit. Well, I may not be perfect, but I'm in hot pursuit. But the only way I can be perfect is to live a mature Christian life. The only way I can live a mature Christian life, the only way I can live up to the place that I should be walking in at this point in my life is if I walk in everything I know to walk in. The only way I can do that is if I give God myself holy, holy, holy. Can't give him part. I gotta give him all. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Hallelujah.